Welcome to Kidney Talk, a program of Renal Support Network, a show that streams health, happiness, and hope to the kidney community. You can download all Kidney Talk shows from iTunes and find a variety of resources to help you navigate this illness at rsnhope.org. Please welcome your host, Lori Hartwell, who has lived with kidney disease since the age of two. Well, welcome to Kidney Talk, everyone. Today, we're going to be discussing a a topic we get so many calls and emails on. People say, I've been diagnosed. They tell me I have stage three or stage four kidney disease. What do I do? So today we have Dr. Cam Calendar Sade, and he's a professor of medicine at public health at UC Irvine School of Medicine at the University of California, Irvine. And everybody calls you Dr. Cam. So let's just let's take it from that. Dr. Cam, welcome to the show. Thank you, Lori. Such a great pleasure and honor for me to be connected to you, Lori. You are, uh, and I'm, uh, if I exaggerate, uh, which is not the case, please uh, uh, accept my apologies. Uh, uh, we refer to you as national treasure because you are the voice of patient and you understand what it means to have CKD. You have lived with that and, and uh, you're very important to us. And again, thank you very much for your leadership. Well, you know, my husband got me a, a little degree that says I have a PhD from the School of Hard Knocks. And um, 53 years of living with this illness, you know, you learn a little bit, right? <laughs> if not, something's wrong. So um, I do feel like I, you know, over the years have come to understand so much about this illness and, and able to, you know, impact change because of it. And uh, that's what an advocate does. So I'm glad to serve my peers and myself because, um, you know, I'm, I'm a lifelong patient. Let's talk about you know, the stages of kidney disease, because we're going to focus on three and four, but maybe you could just go through them because, you know, they're one, two, three, four, five, and I would have na- labeled it differently personally because it's like cancer, um, and it's not the same as cancer. You know, when you have stage four, stage five cancer, it often, you feel like it's a death sentence, and with kidney disease, that's not the same. So can you explain that? Yes. So, Lori, not infrequently, people uh, come to uh, my office, persons, uh, I want to uh, nowadays use the keyword person for patients, and, and because everybody is a person uh, in, its, uh, in his or her entirety. And they ask me, that sometimes I see emotional encounters that somebody's crying, says, Dr. Kalantar, I've come all the way here to see you uh, because I was told I have a disease called chronic kidney disease, it's not even stage one and two, it's stage three. And you're right, Dory, when um, people for good uh, intentions, they came up with this staging, they didn't really foresee the unintended consequences that people really look at this, that this is really a dramatic piece of news to tell somebody that, hey, you have a non-curable disease called chronic kidney disease, and, and you, don't, you, have, you don't even have stage one and two. It's as bad as stage three, right? right. Yep, they're paranoid. They're, they're paralyzed. <laughs> oh, that, that is devastating. Let me tell you, people, uh, sometimes I've seen uh, really how they react. So my job is here to explain, and, I, and, and you're right. Maybe we should all sit down and w- work on and changing some of these uh, staging and terminologies instead of being so uh, uh, obsessed with kidney versus renals, a few things like stage, like t- terminal, terminal, like end stage, like failure. Because when I look at your life, it is you have, uh, if, if I could highlight you, you have had uh, kidney disease stage five, not even stage one, two, three, or four, five, for over half a century. I know. And you are a, a, an example of success story. So this is what we look at. This is not cancer that stage four or five or three is bad news. This is actually something. I mean, this is a disease where we turn around to things into success. And, and you are the role model. You're inspiration oh, well, as well as many others. Many others are like you. So, so you're right. So my, my uh, essentially job is here to spend time to first of all reassure the patient that, hey, let's first of all see if you have stage three. And stage uh, one, and what, then they say, well, how come I didn't know I had stage one or two? So I say that, then I have to explain that, hey, stage one and two means if your kidney function is above 60%, and somebody decided that 60% uh, below is stage three and, and above is stage one and two, because above 60% is even normal unless you have also protein spilling, spillage in the urine, right? 
Mm-hmm. So this is how the staging started for good intentions. But again, people who in in two thousand and one came up with this ca- uh, classification in the National Kidney Foundation probably they wanted to increase the awareness. But these are unintended consequences that we see. Right. Well, you know, it's interesting. We did do a podcast that explains all the stages. And we'll put a little chart up um, in the interest of time, like one, two, three, four, five, because it tells you what your gluminal filtration rate is. And that's why if you can be in stage three, what is the gluminal filtration rate of stage three and stage four? What is the range? Yeah, the units of uh, glomer filtration rate, as you <clears throat> probably present during your podcast, is m- milliliters per minute. And uh, normal or near normal is anything above 60 ml per minute. And we say that usually a normal person has glomer filtration rates of around 80 to 100, right? Mm-hmm. As we get older, it, it goes lower. And uh, 60 and above, again, our biology, our body didn't decide that 60 is normal and 59 is abnormal. This is an arbitrary decision by a group of people, right? So that's another message that I really try to convey to my patients that, hey, don't be obsessed with that number of glomer filtration. Right? Don't come to my office and say, doctor, how come it was 35 last month, so it's not 32. I lost three points. I said that, look, these are... Certain mathematical <laughs> that equations. Can be from they don't even have that can be from drinking more fluid, people. Exactly. So, um, well, well, I know, and we we get this all the time. We have, you know, we had a, a woman who was eighty years old, and she had stage three kidney disease, and I'm, and she had no blood pressure problems and no, no diabetes. And I'm like, wow, you're doing great. Talk to your doctor. You know what I'm saying? Like, you know, yes. if you're eighty you're years so old, correct. and you have, um, um, and I think it's it's so important. Um, um, you know, you can stay stable because the, the normal part of aging is, you know, just like your skin gets a little bit more funky and your hair gets a little more, you know, your kidneys and your organs age too, but doesn't mean that they can't do their job. Lori, what you're saying that for uh, people who have a more advanced age, they, since the calculation includes also age factor, right? So by being older and older, you're S estimated GFR, which is an arbitrary mathematical calculation, goes lower and lower as we get older. So, and, and they did this so that it be consistent with our uh, process of biologic aging. So, therefore, you're right. Somebody at the age of 80 invariably has CKD3, even with uh, what at, may appear to be normal serum creatinine and normal serum cystatin C. So, we need to be careful how to convey this news instead of making it bad news and, and causing so much, such a high level of anxiety and, and uh, devastating reactions, we need to really be more reassuring. A lot of exactly. people with stage three remain stage three for years. Well, people need hope. And if you don't feel like you have any options. Um, so let's go through. So you have stage three or four. And, you know, um, what do people need to do? I mean, just in general, this is good practice because what makes those kidneys progress more if you don't actually have a disease state? Because that's a whole other that's a whole other conversation. If you have a disease state that's going after your kidneys, um, uh, like lupus or something like that. I'm not a doctor, but I do play one on TV. I know that's an old joke, but um, if you just have kidney kidney decline, um, what can you do as a patient? to help yourself? Look, first of all, let me tell you that patients like yourself, you, you, uh, you guys know more about the disease than many of us. So you are the source of knowledge. The second one is what to do once we establish that this is a true CKD and not due to something else. Sometimes people with high muscle mass has high serum creatinine. Uh, as, as you mentioned, also uh, uh, having uh, advanced age chronologically that also it could uh, come across like CKD. So we do a number of tests. I do the several more tests, cystatin C and other things. I also ask uh, 24-hour creatinine, uh, 24-hour urine collections and creatinine clearance. If a patient has really CKD3, which nowadays is dividing into CKD3 A and B, that means if GFR or kidney function is between 45 to 60, which is CKD3 A, Sometimes it's uh, called borderline CKD, and 3B is below 45, 30 to 45. Then I usually start a number of uh, uh, interventions, including medications, older medications, newer medications, and 
lifestyle and diet modification in a in a way that's consistent with patients uh, lifestyle and goals. And this is what we say: it says, look, you want to continue to work hard, mm-hmm. you want to enjoy, you you need to also enjoy a lot of things. So let's continue th- to do this. And I usually tell them that look, there are certain literature about adjusting the diet in right. terms of uh, avoiding too much protein, if possible. And switching to more non-meat-based sources of protein. So these are things that I do, plus also medication. Well, you know, plant-based diet is getting more and more traction. And I think one of the things that we get a lot of calls about, about protein, is people are afraid of protein. They're like, I'm not going to eat any. And that's really dangerous, too. You have to eat a certain amount of protein to keep your albumin up so you don't get an infection. So can you explain, like, just the overall, like, you know, what types of protein people should be taking in um, to keep their uh, kidney function stable? Yeah, very nicely said, because... This is a one size fits all is not usually is not correct. I mean, we can't say that, hey, Dr. Calentar says low protein is good. Dr. Johnson says high protein is good. Look, it is about who is the patient, which stage of kidney disease and where we are, right? So for somebody who is on dialysis, I mean, stage five, requiring dialysis twice a week or three times a week, usually these persons, they need higher protein, protein. Intake, right? But- Right. So high protein, actually, in fact, during my dialysis rounds, right now I'm sitting in one of the dialysis clinics, I go sometimes and pass out uh, uh, high protein burgers during right. my rounds every two to three months so that uh, they know I'm in- encouraging you to eat more. Now, what about CKD3 and 4? For CKD3 and 4, if possible, I say that let's avoid too much protein. Why? Because protein is extra load on the kidneys, right? Right. And then data have been relatively consistent, but we haven't had any randomized trial to, to randomize this versus that to see if plant-based diet works, but data suggests that there is a role for switching what nowadays we call plant-dominant, PLA, plant-dominant, the always sometimes called it Play-Doh diet. There are data suggesting that Play-Doh diet, I mean, if they, they, you eat more uh, source of protein coming from plants and less from animal, and you adjust this for your preference. That should could work should work with uh, uh, slowing the progression of kidney disease and also with uh, lowering the amount of protein leakage, albuminuria, proteinuria. Well, and I mean, you know, I was just hearing a presentation, and I've actually myself, and I just need to say, my GFR is 98%, my fourth transplant, 0.6 creatinine. Hey, I'm back in the game again at number one. Um, uh, <laughs> but... Um, you know, I'm. I don't eat any organ meat anymore. I just. I don't. I don't really like it. But you know, people would like. Oh, I. I you know, it was just common to eat more beef and stuff like that. I really eat chicken and fish and maybe a little turkey and, and you know, kind of limit the protein. And you you do lose the taste for it after a while. But if I, you know, my husband's like, I need a steak. You know, I mean, sometimes people just want a steak. And and I think if you're trying to modify your diet. It's not all or nothing. It's just being extremely mindful and trying to adapt those changes. We are working actually now that based on uh, being inspired by you and others. Uh, we have a project called World Kidney Recipes. We want people to put together um, meal plans. Meal plans means recipes, but for more than one single meal. That right. means uh, essentially you guys go to some uh, some of these uh, uh, I don't want to mention a brand name like uh, Jenny Craig to lose weight. So why don't we have something like this for our CKD3 and 4 patients, but done by the patients, for the patients, and, and <clears throat> work kidney recipes, multicultural, so we enjoy what we do. And, and uh, it, it provides diversity, variety of things with more emphases. Uh, if I give you, for example, a meal plan, I want to have, uh, let's say, Asian fusion with Mexican for my this week. 
and for CKT4. We should have this. We should have. Pocket, right? it's, it's, we have a lot of recipes on our website, but there are so many recipes out there, and, and a lot of them are for ESRD when you're on dialysis, which means you need a higher protein. Um, luckily, though, Medicare is paying now for a dietitian, and I really highly suggest everybody try to get a dietitian because it really will help you understand what you can eat. Um, before we move on to maybe you know the two other causes of what people can do, blood pressure or diabetes, um, can you just make a comment? I, I, I actually start to twinge a little bit when people are saying they're doing the high protein Atkins diet. I yeah, that <laughs> okay. That's a good point. Good point. Uh-huh. Let me tell you this: for somebody who has CKD three, uh, B four, and five without dialysis, and for somebody who like you has a kidney transplant, you want to cherish this uh, kidney. Uh, that means uh, stage three plus. It's like you have an, a car that is not quite functional, but you want this car to last longer, as long as possible, even though it's not a brand new car. Then be careful. Just, just, uh, just be careful and sensitive about this ki- kidney that you have. And uh, don't overburden it with too much meat. Of course, if I suddenly get, let's say I get COVID infection, I get uh, acute kidney injury, then during those uh, transient periods of time, I need higher protein. And then when I switch back to normal uh, function, then I need to make sure that my kidney is not overburdened. And this is what we do. And, and in terms of uh, everything else, we need to know where we are. Well, well, all these great recipes, as you astutely mentioned, some of them are for dialysis patients. Also, there are all certain challenges, like uh, medications cause high potassium, known as hyperkalemia, right. and uh, plant-based diet inherently may have more potassium because it's a healthier diet. And so there are uh, essentially what you suggested, Lori, we need to work with the dietitians, dietitians who, who know the field, because a lot of dietitians, they have learned how to provide care and, and uh, recommendations to dialysis patients. But they may not quite know that CKD, earlier CKD stages without dialysis is a dis, uh, would benefit from a different approach. So that's what, very important. It's, it's so important. And I mean, I think, you know, I keep trying to explain to people because when you have a stage three or four kidney disease and four is a little bit higher, you have to be even more cautious. Um, you know, anything that dries out your kidney is not good. So I've actually had calls from marathon runners who've won into kidney kidney failure because they, you know, ran so much and didn't drink enough, their kidneys shut down. And that's called an acute kidney injury. I'm sure you see it. And then with this high protein, these diets that are going around, protein, and I love how my friend who's a nurse says it, it jams the dam. That's what she said. You get so much protein, it can shut your kidneys down. And also why you lose weight on those high protein diets is because you lose a lot of water weight first. And it dries your kidneys out. It dries them out. You want the kidneys soggy and moist. And yes, comfy. very nice. Said. Very <laughs> nice. Said. Look, there is a, uh, a the dominant uh, prevailing culture of high-protein Atkin diet to lose weight. And I have nothing against that. We just need to be careful because uh, uh, there is a lot of discussions and dieting for diabetes and for uh, cardiovascular disease. But uh, some of them could really be somewhat uh, extra burden and even harmful for the exactly. kidney health, right? Well, when- so, so we need to be careful here, really, and, and know what we are doing. Well, I had a friend on Facebook, you know, we have lots of friends on Facebook, but they're like, and I'm on this high-protein diet, I'm eating... Uh, bacon and eggs and cheese and I'm like oh my god you're gonna have a heart attack um uh you know just thinking this is a great way and you know fad diets just don't work you just have to change your lifestyle of eating um so let's let's move on a little bit to the two number one causes of kidney failure high blood pressure and diabetes these are nothing to fool around with because you don't often feel it so um so if anybody's been diagnosed with stage three or stage four, this is the most important thing you can do. Yeah, I, usually if it comes from hypertension, let's say roughly in this country, uh, we have 10% of the adult population having CKD, true CKD. I say, say 10 to 15%, I would say that if you want to be uh, conservative, it's around closer to 10% than closer to 15%, which is a lot 
We're talking about 20 million people in this country having CKD stage 3 and 4. And is that 90% for, of people. Is that I mean, from high blood pressure or diabetes or just... Yes, yeah, it, it is. These two together, they are the cause of 75% or three-quarters of all CKDs in this country. High, uh, diabetes is almost half of patients with CKD. They have CKD because of diabetes and the other 25% is uh, is because of hypertension, and the remaining twenty five percent is all other hundred other disease states. Right, right. Autoimmune, lupus, inflammation. I was hemolytic uremic syndrome, PKD, polycystic genetic. I'm just trying to run down the list. But so seventy five percent, approximately, of kidney failure is due to high blood pressure and diabetes. Guys, that is a wake up call. Everybody should have a blood pressure cuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's correct. We just, uh, but uh, let me put it this way: while we need to emphasize prevention, we need to be careful uh, that uh, people who already have CKD, you still can do prevention. It's called secondary prevention. I mean, now that I have CKD, is it too late? And and sometimes they feel when we talk about prevention, they feel that. They, 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 they could feel emotional because they say, oh, so I'm already past that, so there's nothing for me to do. I said, no, there's also secondary and tertiary prevention. Primary prevention means what we said, if you, are, if you don't have kidney disease, this is what you need to do to be careful with blood pressure, with glycemic control and everything. But if you have the news that you have CKD and it's confirmed, then let's continue with secondary and tertiary prevention. That means how to slow progression. Mm -hmm. and how to allow these kidneys to last longer. Fortunately, we are in an era, we passed the era of early dialysis, better dialysis. Now we are in an era that even the government uh, is adjusting certain policies to uh, encourage nephrologists and specialists and centers, clinics, to go for laster, longing, native and transplant kidneys. Well, and, you know, going back to high blood pressure, though, you know, you have a patient that's stage three and their blood pressure is, you know, what, what blood pressure is ideal? What, where, where are you a happy doctor at? What, what is the BP? This is where, uh, I, I don't want to disappoint you, where there's still debate. Now, if you look at the upper number that's called systolic blood pressure, we all, there are newer data They say that 120 and lower is better. And there are older data that says 120 to 140 is a better goal. I try because uh, usually there is a rule of uh, in everything in life is I uh, call it the policy of uh, or Goldilocks rule. That means there is a sweet spot. We should not overdo anything while we are not super, uh, underdoing that thing. So I usually t t work with my patients to be around 120, 130, and I say that hey, if it goes too low, you may feel you may pass out, and and in fact, you may, the kidneys may not get enough. Perfusion, but there are nephrologists who feel that based on some data, we should go even lower than 120 on the upper number, which is called systolic number. So I would say that uh, without, uh, uh, notwithstanding the confusion this discussion may cause, 120, around 120 is probably a better target for people who have CKD stage 3 and 4. And not I to go too low or high. And I, you know, I also heard, too, that um, when I was having blood pressure problems, because, you know, um, I have belief that the majority of blood pressure problems are a lot of them is due to fluid and you start to build up fluid. And if you limit your sodium, that can help um, with the fluid. Uh, but I, I think it's important what time of day you take it. And and uh, my doctor told me, which I was surprised that your blood pressure is higher in the morning because you need a higher blood pressure to wake up. And I'm like, oh, okay. So it's good to write them down in the morning and night and then show them to your doctor because then he can see over time how it's changed. It, it, to have that critical... Have you ever had any patients that walk yeah. in with a Actually, list of their blood pressure? Say, look, what you said is so cor correct. I usually, when they say, hey, Dr. Calanta, I was waiting to see you. And I said that, look, if you want to see me, then I expect from you... Uh, as you just said, Lori, that every morning you check blood pressure and every evening before you go to bed, you check blood pressure and write down a piece of paper. And this is your homework. Every three months to six months you come to see me, I need to see those numbers. Right. And then sometimes patient asks me, so, so I did it for three months. Uh, uh, should I continue? I say, of course. 
So how long, doctor? I said, forever. And, and then I asked the patient, I tell her, look, do you stop eating breakfast or lunch? If not, this is essentially an agreement between you and me. You're going to check your blood pressure from now on forever. Why? Because it's a way for you to be in control. You want to be in control, right, of right. your life and your kidney health. Right. I mean, I mean, I, and I totally agree about the blood pressure because now with this transplant, I, you know, I pee all I can pee. That's all I can say. I mean, it is just amazing how this kidney works. And I have to keep my pressure up and I don't take any blood pressure medicine. But my transplant doc was like, you don't let that pressure drop below 100. I need that kidney being nice and soggy. Um, and, and it's really true. I mean, you yeah, know, you're excellent doctor. Let me tell you, Laura, you have an excellent doctor because some, uh, as I said, sometimes uh, you think the lower blood pressure, the better. As I said, the Goldilocks approach. There is a sweet spot. We can't go too low. Right. The same way that we avoid too high blood pressure, you also have to make sure that blood pressure doesn't go too low. And in, and I, I can be at 90 over 60 and fine, but I start chugging the water and trying to get the pressure up because my kidney just perfuses so well. It's a, uh, and, and you have to be careful about that. And then, you know, with blood pressure medicine, there's so many out there now. There's the, the, the slow acting, the fast acting, the weekly patches, uh, whatever it is, you just got to take it when it's prescribed, guys. <laughs> well, look, let me put it this way, that eventually some of them, one or some of them works the best for this versus that person, right? So if the era, if individualized personalized medicine, we need to make sure sometimes I try this and that, and that's finally two of these medication or patches work the best for Mr. Smith or for exactly. Ms. Jones works something else, right? Exactly. You know, I actually had a medication error and I had a blood pressure patch and, you know, they, I guess they have one, two, three, four. And they gave, you know, I guess I was on the lower one, but they gave me a three or something. And I put that patch on and I couldn't wake up. And I mean, I'm like, took the patch. And I'm like, we, we realized it was a, you know. And so the other message is check your prescriptions when you get them from the pharmacy. <laughs> um, I mean, it never happens, but it happened to me once. And it. I didn't really understand it. You know what I'm saying? But, you know, it's important that you stay engaged because medical errors happen. And uh, and then, you know, with blood pressure meds, if you have side effects, I mean, one of my friends, and I even experienced, you have that dry cough. You can't get rid of that dry. That's a blood pressure medicine that can cause that, right? You got to yeah. gotta talk to the doctor about it. It's connected. <laughs> so well said. So well said. Medications, they interfere. They they essentially, they, they may aggravate each other's effects or, or may, may be against each other. So we need to be careful about these medications. Always, I tell my patients, I say, look, if you have CKD, if you go to the heart doctor, you go to endocrinologist, and he or she wants to add one more or, or, or change another thing, please double check with me because, right. the, because we are here to make sure that uh, the kidney care part of that remains without any issue, right? Right. So we need to be careful. We need to coordinate the care. And the nephrologist or the person who knows the kidney uh, health care the best, he or she needs to be in control and coordinate across different specialties for that given patient. You're so correct on that because, um, you know, you're given another medication and medication reconciliation is the buzzword. Um, but, you know, before we move on to the diabetes care, the most important thing going back to diet, and I, I think I know this answer pretty well, is control your sodium. That is one of the easiest ways to help with your blood pressure. Very just, nicely said, correct. Just try to control the sodium. And I'm here to tell you that if you control your sodium for 21 days, this is Dr. Scribner, who's the grandfather of dialysis. When we would have lunch on his houseboat, he'd say, that's what patients have to do. And 21 days, you lose the flavor of it. You don't crave those those Doritos anymore. And I can say that this is true because I've been in the hospital, I've been sick, and I come out and I eat something that's not even salty. And I'm like, oh, my God, that's so salty. <laughs> Um, and so you can lose the taste. It just takes a little bit of work because those Doritos well, well, have a way of calling you. Those Doritos just have a way to summon your name. Um, and, and the companies formulate them that way. I mean, the salty, sweet taste is like crack. <laughs> yes, yes, you're right. right. We, we need to we need to, uh, to find ways. I mean, uh, of course, we can't deny that food is an important part of life. It's about quality of life. We need to continue to enjoy That's why... 
we need to come up with a way to create again this uh, to to expand our exactly. meal plans options for our patients, your patients. Just my watch patients. the but cooking are- network. The cooking network will make you a pro. I have learned so much watching the cooking network on how to prepare food with spices and and herbs. So there's so many options, and YouTube is our friend. Um, let's move on to diabetes because that is the number one cause of kidney failure. Well, there's type 1 and type 2. Type 1 is juvenile, but I think we need to focus on type 2. Um, what can people do <laughs> to stop it pro- from progressing to kidney failure? Yeah, actually, nowadays, now that you said uh, type 2 is the main uh, cause of CKD in this country, uh, 95% of diabetic patients with kidney disease, they have type 2. That means essentially the type that uh, is uh, is developed uh, as an adult person, and uh, while we gain weight or uh, other hormonal problems, so the, the, the diabetes is known to affect vessels, and there are small vessels, micro vessels, and big vessels. Micro, the small vessels they exist in the back of the eyes and in the kidneys, right, and right. in the nerves, and that's why the mo- uh, one important, and if you have diabetes, an important uh, uh, monitoring approach is to look at the back of the eyes. It's called ret- retina, to see if you have developed retinopathy, right? And retinopathy, because there are small vessels in the back of the eyes, if they are affected, chances are that the small vessels inside the glomeruli of the kidneys are also affected, right? Mm-hmm. So yep. that's why we in nephrology we say that eyes are windows to the kidneys in diabetes, mm-hmm. right? So so, and, and then we can see, of course, it doesn't mean that, hey, uh, I don't have any retinopathy, which is the second cause of blindness in this country nowadays, and, and which is uh, preventable with uh, uh, diabetes retinopathy. But if we look at, if you have diabetes, I want to suggest, and as an nephrologist, that every year you try to check the, the, uh, the eyes, especially for diabetic retinopathy, because if there is sign of diabetic retinopathy, chances are that your kidneys are also involved. And also, going back to the kidney per se, usually the first sign is that kidneys start spilling protein or albumin, small amounts. It's called microprotein or microalbumin in the urine. That's right. how we you also get, figure it out. It's called spilling protein. When the doctor tells you you got point one, I don't know, one, the spilling number one, two, three, and four. And four is the worst on that one, right? <laughs> yeah, there, there are the, yeah, there are different approaches. It's uh, measured as milligrams per day or milligrams per gram of creatinine in the urine, either spot urine or tonfire urine. And when it goes up above certain level, uh, then we say that, hey, you have, you started uh, spilling protein or albumin. Albumin is a t- different, is a, is a dominant type of protein. And this is where we notice that uh, the diabetes has started affecting the kidney. Right? right, And of course, you may say, well, what should I do now uh, that diabetes is, is affecting my eyes and kidneys or one of them or both of them? It usually happens on uh, both of them at the same time. And then at this, and there are also small vessels on the nerves. Therefore, you, there's usually nothing for these patients. They feel also they have burning sensation or uh, ant crawling sensation. It's called neuropathy, right? So right. all these three usually go together. Most of the time, but not all of the time, diabetes retinopathy, diabetes, diabetic nephropathy, and neuropathy. Right. And, and when you have one of them, you may have the other two, so more reasons for us to double-check on the other two organs. Well, and what's really wonderful is technology has progressed. I mean, I remember with my third transplant, I had some spilling of protein. And then I was, I, um, you know, because it lasted me 20 years and then I had to get a fourth one. But, you know, there was a, I was in that CKD 3-4 and my nephrologist prescribed a drug that took the protein out and my protein dropped. So there's a lot of things they can do. And then I also have several friends that are type 2 diabetics and they monitor their blood sugar like a hawk you got to keep that blood sugar normal and what what would you say is a good goal look now that you said that similar to our discussion on blood pressure blood sugar is also an a, a one of those targets that we need to make sure we don't overdo this because sometimes 
in in our good intention to lower blood pressure, we need we need to avoid hypoglycemia. When blood sugar, for example, is below seventy, right? Right. You don't want to so be hypoglycemic. Hypoglycemic. Yeah. yeah. Hypoglycemic episodes could also be dangerous. I would even say so. Let's make sure. And then, some as as kidney function gets worse over time, the uh, <coughs> insulin in the blood lasts longer. So sometimes patients say, say "Doctor, I've had diabetes for twenty years, and now suddenly I don't need uh, some of these medications because my blood sugar is lower and lower." Does it mean I'm cured? I said, "No. It just means that you need less medication because the insulin lasts longer." It's uh, it's per se not a bad news, a good news, but we need to adjust the medication so that you don't become hypoglycemic, you don't pass out, right? Right. So, so we should be around hundred. Some people say, "What about uh, uh, a doctor? I'm a dialysis patient." I said, "If you're a dialysis patient, I don't want even to go below hundred because I don't want you to have the risk of hypoglycemic episodes and passing out and going to emergency room." The same way that we don't want to have high blood sugar, we don't want to have too low blood sugar. So this is yet another place to be very careful right? and to constantly adjust with medication. So as CKD progresses over time, the the amount of uh, 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 medication may change. And now that you said also about the advancement in pharmaco- pharmacotherapy, yes, there are newer medications. Some of them you guys may have heard is called SGLT2 inhibitors. Uh, we used to have ACE inhibitors, ARBs, lisinopril, losartan. Now there is SGLT2 inhibitors. But as anything in life, everything has a price. I, I'm not talking about monetary price. I'm talking about side effects. So right. this needs to be done correctly. <clears throat> and, 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 and medications, they interfere with each other. Medications need to be monitored closely so that we not cause more harm. Well, and I always like to explain to people who call me about diabetes. I said, you know, when your blood sugar is high, just think about your blood vessels and little tiny shards of glass running around in them. And it scars them. And then they're scarred so much they don't, the, the blood doesn't flow through them. And, and you know, and trying to get them to understand that, you know, if you let your blood sugar go high for just a day or two and then, oh, I'm going I'm to splurge this weekend. And you know you're you're hurting yourself. It's and, I, and I'm not saying it's always easy, but monitoring that blood sugar will will help you keep your kidney health. And very um, nice to say. Very nice to say. That actually, studies have shown uh, if we can uh, control blood sugar and avoid hyperglycemia, that means high blood sugar, we may be able to uh, uh, prevent. Diabetic retinopathy, that means uh, back of the eye, nephropathy and neuropathy. That's so correct. Well, and, and I mean, we're going to be wrapping up here. And I, I just want to emphasize that and nobody, everybody wants the magic pill. And there is no magic pill for this. It just takes you getting on your game, taking control of your diet, managing your blood pressure and managing your diabetes. And that means so well taking said. pills so well every day or whenever or however they're prescribed and, you know, figure out any way we have. We're, we're so lucky. We have cell phones. You can put alarms on them for everything. Um, my one friend's type, you know, has a little monitor on her and it beeps when her blood sugar's wrong and then she can she can adjust it. So she's got real time blood sugar monitoring. Yeah, um, actually, nowadays we have a continuous glucose monitoring. Uh, certain devices are available. Every few minutes, you see your blood sugar on, on your cell phone. It's amazing. It's, I mean, it's how, amazing. Yeah, I mean, how things have changed. But can I say something that you mentioned, uh, and and to um, to reiterate what you said, it's a multimodal integrated approach. There is no right. silver bullet per se. It all works together when we combine them and use them carefully, from diet to pharmacotherapy to devices. All together. Is it? And, you know, and, you know, making lifestyle changes is hard. And I totally understand that. Um, you know, our, RSN has several support groups. We meet several times a month online. We have all kinds of activities. And if you're having t- trouble struggling, come talk to other patients. Find out how they're managing it. I mean, you know, that's what I've found in my lifetime, that one friend makes a difference. And you find somebody who's been through what you've been through and knows how to manage it. And then I don't want to say, you know, I want to go back to like AA or something, but, you know, they become somebody who can be a mentor friend to you and Look, help uh, you. Lori, well, well, let me tell you what you said. Renal Support Network is so important. This is an important resource here for our patients. And I always uh, t- 
tell my patients when I see that they feel confused, that's why I said, look, why don't you look up? There is renal support network group. There, there are others. So t- just go and join them and take advantage of the resources right. they have for you because you feel that you're not by yourself. Right? Exactly. So, and and exactly. I wanted to thank you for your leadership creating this RSN renal support network. This is amazing. I mean, the patients I have I mean, your keyword. Is. Can I reiterate your keyword? Hope. No, you know what? I mean, it was so funny in the 90s when, you know, I had my third transplant and um, I was 24 and my first two didn't work, as you know. So I spent, you know, age 12 to 24 on dialysis. I was on dialysis in 1968 as well. I lived my whole life with this illness. And um, 24, I got this kidney and I came out of the hospital with a 2.2 creatinine. And it was a difficult third transplant. And that kidney lasted me 20 years at a 2.2 creatinine. So any you can keep your creatinine steady. But what I want to say is that I just saw so many of my friends giving up. And then, you know, I always tell people who have kidney disease, you got to find the people who are doing well. Don't go to the dialysis waiting room or don't go to the doctor and find the person who's not taking care of themselves. And decide you're going to become buddies. That's not a tr- that's not a success recipe. You well, find what the- you just said is a very uh, telling story. That means on day one uh, or a few first few months, if serum creatinine is two point four, some people say that kidney doesn't last more than one or two years. But you showed twenty years. I kept that amazing. kidney for twenty years at a two point two creatinine. Amazing. And and it was um, and I did some things. The doctors told me because I'm very short, I'm like four foot ten. I said I'm taller than I look, but I'm four foot ten. And you know, it's like you know, if you get pregnant, you might put some stress on the kidney. And, and I'm like, hey, this is my third one. I'm not, I'll just adopt puppies the rest of my life, and I have a lot of them running around right now. And you know, I just <laughs> made decisions that you know always were what I wanted, but I knew if I didn't maintain my health, I couldn't do anything else. And I, I found how to adjust. And then, you know, I just found so many people giving up. And I've gotten a little impatient over the years um, because, you know, I like to help the people who like to help themselves. I get really tired of the people who just you know, complain and complain and complain and they don't take action. I don't have time for them um, because it's there's so many people who need help. And you but need to actually, be... But actually, Dory, what you say is to be in control. What you did... Right. What you're describing that you took the control instead of allowing uh, healthcare professionals and others, doctors, to decide about you. You became part, not only part of the team, you are the head of the team like, taking care of your, it, it, care, your health, right? Exactly. And if you're depressed... And if you are denial, there's a whole book. I wrote a whole book called Chronically Happy. That talks chronically happy, damn it, is the real name. It takes a little anger to be happy with a chronic illness. <laughs> and um, and I think it's important if you don't have, ask your family, friends, say, I need help. Because if you're depressed, it's hard to make changes. And so you need to adjust that. I mean, it's just, it's all a vicious cycle. But, but look, but uh, Lori, let me... Let me just say that uh, p- part of the uh, bad news of having CKD and, and it's, there is no cure for CKD and you're going to need dialysis or transplant. So, of course, it's not the best news of life that you receive. So, at the same time, I, uh, you are the source of hope. You are the role model because I'm the doctor. I'm sitting on the other side, right? right. And, I, and patient needs to relate to somebody right. who has that disease and who dealt with this and who was successful. So you are the source of uh, giving inspiration and hope And that's to what all I saw. Patients. That's what I saw in the 90s. I said, you know what? If people don't have hope, it doesn't matter what the doctors do. It doesn't matter. That's what I was. I'm like, I would have a friend that I just loved that I go, but they just gave up hope and they just slowly disappeared. And then I saw other people who had hope and they went on to thrive. And and uh, my, my test for asking people, you know, they have these big fancy depression surveys, right? And I'm like, do you have anything? to look forward to <laughs> that's my question and, and 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 if they say no i'm like you know try to get them in the mindset of well you know you need to find something to, to look forward to and it's Wonderful. hard work 
but um, and then try to get them to, you know, because when you're diagnosed with an illness, there's a whole other topic there. But um, it's very important. You just, you know, it, it's a gift. A life is a gift and don't throw it away. Um, with that, uh, Dr. Dr. Cam, uh, thank you so much. Uh, we have some other podcasts you can listen to, but this gives us some insight into stage three and four. I Just to sum it up, you need to take care of your blood pressure, you need to take care of your, your diet, and you need to manage diabetes if you have it. And, and then nice. s- And then stay in contact with your healthcare team. Don't miss those appointments. Um, and get your labs drawn regularly so you can you can make sure that you have the best information to take care of yourself. So with that, um, to Kidney Health. Thank you, Lori. It, it was such a great pleasure and honor for me to be connected with you and your Renal Support Network group. Thank you very much. Thanks for listening to Kidney Talk, a program of Renal Support Network. Please make sure to find us on Facebook or sign up for our newsletter at rsnhope.org. Kidney Talk is intended for informational purposes only. It is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment from your physician. Always seek the advice of your own health care provider regarding your medical condition.